The next talk is uh, co-authored Alan Henningsen, Bob Campbell, and myself. Bob Campbell would be doing the presentation. He's the ecologist <coughs> botanist for the Fish Lake National Forest in Richfield, Utah. He's been there. Uh, well, he began his career 32 years ago here with the Intermountain Research Station in Logan on the Aspen Ecosystem Project. And he worked in U uh, Logan, or Utah for 70, in Logan for 70, from 74 to 84, and then went to the Forestry Science Lab in Missoula. He earned his master's in forestry from the University of Montana, and then moved to Richfield in 1993. And I think it's fair to say that the emphasis that is being placed on Aspen today is a direct result of Bob Campbell moving back to Utah. He'll deny this, but he has been a real mover and shaker in bringing Aspen to the level of uh, interest that we're seeing today. Alan uh, Henningsen is a forest subculturist on the Fish Lake National Forest. He graduated from Utah State in 72 and began his 33 year career doing a for, uh, timber inventory on several forests in the In Mountain region Medicine Bow, Caribou, Ashley, uh, Salmon, Chalice, Targhee, Wasatch, and most recently on the Fish Lake since 1988. Um, the um, title of this presentation is Aspen Restoration Efforts on the Fish Lake National Forest Lessons That We've Learned. Bob? Thank you, Dale. Um, just a, a word about uh, Alan as our uh, lead on this paper, uh, this presentation. Alan has uh, been the civil culturist there on the Fish Lake for 18 years and is been responsible for uh, all of these uh, treatments that you'll see here today that have involved harvests and, and he's also, when I think of Alan, I think of exclosures and fences and uh, he's been remarkable and he's in, in doing that, very proactive and he's done a, a great job of gathering the information that we're using in this presentation. You'll notice that Dale is also a co-author with us. Dale has um, been a huge help to us on the Fish Lake and uh, has been to all of these sites that we'll feature in this presentation here and has helped us greatly with our assessment of, of Aspen on the forest, <clears throat> our Aspen situation. Uh, we, we do acknowledge and appreciate the interactions that we've had with uh, researchers uh, uh, with the Rocky Mountain Station uh, from many locations who have been on the ground with us as well as many professors and students from universities that have uh, helped us in, in our Aspen efforts. Fish Lake is uh, located in south central Utah, uh, mostly west of, uh, mostly east of I-15 and, and I-70. Uh, the junction of the two are uh, right there at, uh, at Cove Fort. We have uh, seven subsections that we talk about on the forest and uh, we also have a wildland fire use plan in this paper today. Um, we'll be hearing a lot about uh, Monroe Mountain, a lot about what's happening in Monroe Mountain, and, and really a lot of the issues are on the northern part of Monroe Mountain. We have some areas that we'll feature on the Fish Lake Plateau, and then some on the Tusher Mountains. Our present situation with our aspen is that, uh, that aspen clones will uh, grow and, and uh, provide new sprouts or suckers, as we often call them, from the parent root systems, and this will happen following fires and harvest and other treatments. Historically our fire records will show that uh, these areas burned about every 20 to 60 years, but many of the areas have not burned in the last 150 or 200 years or longer. Um, many of these areas will convert from aspen forest to mixed conifers in the absence of fire. And uh, with this uh, decline, this conversion, we see a loss in biodiversity, forage uh, and water yield, and uh, this occurs uh, as, this, as the aspen systems convert to mixed conifer. Also with our present situation, we have uh, 
situations where deer, elk, sheep, cattle will all relish aspen suckers at certain seasons of the year. Um, Charles Kay has, has said to us while we've been out in the field that we have too many mouths, wild and domestic ungulates, and not enough fire. Livestock in these areas were not uh, there historically, and uh, as you heard earlier, the numbers of deer and elk were much lower than they are now. Over the last 25 years, these are some of the things that uh, that uh, has been happening on the forest. Um, Alan has been responsible for um, these uh, timber sales with aspen. Um, the number of different, um, not just units, but actual areas, and many of the areas each have several units, but there's been over 900 acres of aspen that have been harvested. And uh, then we've had timber sales of conifer and, and prescribed fire that account for 8,800 acres. There's been prescribed fire, wildfire, and wildland fire use in these areas, over 35,000 acres. Now, um, we realize that not all of those acres have aspen associated with them, but, but uh, in our abstract we talked at over 20,000 and uh, there is a, a large number that's been treated there. Um, this, this is a conservative estimate. We'd say that uh, we have successful aspen regeneration on at least uh, 50 to 60 percent of, of the harvested areas and if we were to take out two or three of, of those areas it would be much higher than that. And then for the areas where we had fire as a part of the treatment and uh, larger areas treated with fire, probably uh, upwards 78 to 80 percent success with our, our treatments. When we're talking about uh, our aspen landscapes, this, this is a, a picture of the north end of Monroe Mountain. Uh, uh, we, we have situations where we're having aspen convert to, to uh, spruce and fir and we also have aspen that's being replaced by sagebrush um, and that occurs in the, in the absence of fire and the presence of heavy ungulate use. So this would be an example of where the, the conifer is coming in to the aspen. Here's an example of where, <coughs> and although there's some conifer there, on this particular hillside you would, would be able to see a, a lot of remnants of old aspen trees and where the sagebrush is actually replacing the aspen in the absence of fire. We've uh, made good use of Wayne's Triangle. Many of you are, most of you are, I'm sure, familiar with this. Um, Three-sided uh, uh, triangle that talks about the, the effects of, uh, uh, or the function of, of these different factors in aspen regeneration, the hormonal stimulation, the environment, and the protection. Some of the lessons that we've uh, learned from this with regard to hormonal stimulation, uh, we feel that all of the areas that have been treated with aspen on, on our forest have produced a sufficient number of suckers to have stalked that stand. And uh, treatments have been done in every season of the year with success uh, in terms of producing suckers. Um, we do see differences in the clonal uh, response, um, both to the numbers of suckers that are produced and also the, the attraction uh, to and use by various animals. Protection is, is the foundation of the triangle and it's important that if protection is necessary in a certain area that you get that protection there early. This is also from Wayne's paper. These are different kinds of manipulation techniques that can be used to provide that hormonal stimulation. Um, we have, um, we'll kind of use this as an outline of where we're going with this paper um, and, and as we go down through it, um, we, we have been doing some of each of these with the exception of regenerating from seed. Now the mechanical root stimulation, um, we, we really haven't been doing that but we'll show you a little bit about roots. But here's an example of doing nothing. Um, example of where uh, these aspen, they have the foliage that's coming right down to the ground, it's, it's a rounded edge, you cannot see hardly any uh, white bowls when you look into that, that's doing very well. This would, might be referred to as a fairy ring or a skirt around the trees here. Obviously there's been something that's caused that to happen and it, uh, there, there are a variety of things that could could have caused that, but, but nonetheless that's, that stand is, is reproducing on its own. 
We've often showed this as an example of a stand that's in properly functioning condition. In, in this case, you have multiple uh, ages of stems within this aspen stand. And it, it was doing just fine without any kind of a, of a treatment at all. For examples of doing nothing, uh, the first picture that I showed you of the fairy rings, this is actually right across the valley on the other side. And, and you'll notice that these, and, and this continues right on up here. Here you have more fairy rings and you have them right here, but right over here you don't. That's, that's clonal variation. Something's different about the way that animals are attracted to those two clones in, in that case. Protection uh, with black, black netting. This is a way that, uh, that uh, we've attempted to put up some, some black net in some areas where, where there are a few aspen trees present and just see if, if protecting the area will allow the suckers to, to get going. Uh, this actually has it was a treated area, but it has a black net exposure around it. We put in eight of those. Uh, six of them were cut down. They, we wondered if the, they would go through the winter snows okay. They made it through the winter okay, but for some reason people wanted to cut those nets down. Now we're not saying who did it or why, but we socially could not keep those net exposures up. Removal of vegetation competition. Um, We've had some Boy Scouts go out with uh, bow saws and, and cut some of these. Alan has also had a very successful uh, commercial Christmas tree program, and these kinds of settings are, are where he's, he's been getting Christmas trees. Uh, with prescribed fire, we can uh, see the response of aspen regeneration coming in after a, a fire, and it will actually move out away from the edge of the trees, maybe as much as uh, 50, 75 feet out into the, to the openings. This is uh, our one slide that we'll offer for some root stimulation. Actually, uh, Dale and Wayne uh, came to the forest in 95 uh, following our Aspen Research Summit and, and began a study of, of roots in areas where there were pure aspen and mixed conifer aspen to see if, if we had sufficient roots to regenerate in, in the mixed conifer areas. And, and yes, we do have sufficient uh, aspen roots to, to restock a, a stand. Fish Lake National Forest, probably all of you want to know about the Pando clone. So, so this is the Pando clone, right here. And, and this is the harvest unit that we'll be showing you. It was actually harvested three different times. Um, th this is a, a, a picture of, of the growing inside. There's actually a, a fence right here. This is outside. This is the east uh, side of the fence, and so you can see the, the regeneration that have, is coming up in there. Alan had treatments there and I believe uh, 88 and 89 and then the, the larger area was cut in 92 and fenced in 92. And this is an example of what the, the Pando clone looks like outside. It's about 105 acres in size and 140, or 47,000 ramets. And this is uh, what it looks like inside. We do have some deer that managed to get in, and so even the regeneration inside is, is hedged on the lower edge. Uh, another shot of it, uh, you can't tell from the picture, but this is Dale and Charles walking into the clone. They have some transects that they're studying in there, and, and this is just uh, outside of the exposure below the road. So that's a, a little bit about the Pando clone. We'll go to Sheep Valley. And uh, this was our Aspen Research Summit. Uh, there's Walt Mugler right there for those that, uh, that have not met Walt. Uh, what, a, what a treat it is to hear that they're doing this RNA in his, his honor. Uh, but uh, we, we greatly benefited by having uh, the, pretty much all the experts in Aspen ecology in, in the West on the forest in 95 that uh, laid the foundation for a lot of what we've been doing. Take a look at, at this, uh, and this is, is a harvest unit that Alan laid out, uh, and Sheep Valley Harvest, uh, about, uh, about 80 acres. And that's what it looked like in 2003, pretty much from that same setting. This is, uh, uh, the success of that was a, 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 an electric fence that was down below that. This is another view of the Sheep Valley Harvest. Uh, 
we were just looking at that area right there. You can tell that they're doing very well since 1995. This is just over the hill to the, the west uh, on our research summit too last summer where we went back and revisited some of these same issues. This is the, the Sheep Valley harvest. Do you see why we needed that low fence there? This is uh, the, the low fence, this is outside the fence, and this is inside the fence. And the next picture comes from just right up there. This is a, a partial harvest. We're suggesting now that maybe we don't want to clear cut everything, but if we go in and just take out part of the, the trees, we'll get enough to get a regeneration response. This is White Ledge. Um, this, is, this is one of our uh, noted failures on the forest, and Dale talks about this often when he goes in other places. Dale took this picture in 1998. Uh, it was then uh, burned in, in, uh, as a prescribed fire in 1999, looked like that, like this. Dale and I got to that point right there in July, mid-July of 1999, took a picture which we cannot find. That's one of the lessons learned, is that it's pretty hard to find pictures from, from several years ago. We estimated that there were 15 to 20,000 suckers per acre in the 6 inch to 10 inch size class just coming up um, and we said we'll come back next month and run our transects. We went back the next month and there wasn't anything left and there hasn't been anything there since then. Um, we've, uh, this, this is in 99, this is in 2006. When I want to say it hasn't been anything in there, has not been any aspen regeneration there. Our wildlife biologist uh, did some uh, transects in there and feels that it was about a third elk, a third deer, and a third cattle. They all had their mouth full, but we don't have any aspen growing at White Ledge in, in, this, in this area. This is just down the road to the south, uh, part of the White Ledge area at, at Bale Creek. Uh, this is uh, what it looked like in 99 and in 2000. This is uh, still at the White Ledge area. There's a, a low fence exposure that Alan put in shortly after the harvest. And this is, this is a three-way exposure. Three-way exposures are wonderful. Um, here, here's the high fence, eight-foot fence, and here's the low fence. Uh, this is pretty much the only place in that whole harvest unit where we have aspen regeneration. And, and for, for those that wonder about climate change, I often suggest put up an eight-foot fence and see how that changes the climate. <laughs> This, this is going to, to Dry Creek now. Um, again, it was, it was cut in 99. Um, it was fenced immediately after for livestock, a low fence. Here is, is the only eight foot exposure in there. And that's the only place where we have aspen regeneration. We enjoyed having them on the forest last year as we talked about Dry Creek. It's always good to have uh, Dale and Charles there to to share some information. Commercial harvest at Forshea, 1998, right there, and uh, 2006. It, it is fenced with a low fence. Uh, most of these harvests, uh, Alan's run some transects this summer, most of them have in the neighborhood of 15 to 20,000 suckers per acre. Again, two other shots of uh, successful regeneration on Forshea. Forshea is on Monroe Mountain also, but it's on the south end of Monroe Mountain. We don't have near the wildlife pressure there that we do on the north end. Tidwell Slopes over uh, east of Fish Lake. This uh, picture and this picture are taken from the same spot, just looking in opposite directions from the top of that fence. And there's the exclosure there. Um, Th these are now doing very well. This is a, a picture of the, of the three-way exclosure outside the low fence, the high fence. And that's what the area looks like now. But for more than 50 acres of this, there's not any aspen regeneration. There's only aspen regeneration inside the fence. However, if you go up the slope a half mile, we have Fee Busby standing in an area that's completely unprotected and the aspen regeneration is just doing great there. We think this area may be 
protected somewhat by the slope. Maybe there's a clonal difference in any attraction to the animals, but not all areas need to be protected. Commercial harvest at uh, Briggs Hollow. Um, about uh, 70 acres, I believe, was harvested at, at Briggs Hollow. Uh, there, there were five units. These are just a couple of them. This portion right here is what it looks like now in 2006. There's a high fence exposure here uh, and uh, right in that area. Notice you can see the, the windrowed tops there. They, they left a lot of the tops on the ground and, and this area only has a low fence around it. The, the, the notion was that just leaving the tops of the trees would, would maybe be a, sufficient to keep most of the animals from, from getting in there and eating off the young regeneration. Talk about prescribed fire for just a minute. Uh, this this area was uh, is where this picture is taken from. Uh, this this entire area has been involved with prescribed burning, and it's been very light. And many of the crowns are still there, but it's it's been enough of a treatment to cause some regeneration to come up. And you can see that uh, there's there's still pretty good numbers there. Um, in in this particular one. I was going to mention a number. Yes, uh, Alan got 33,000 suckers per acre through this, uh, this treatment this year. The Marysville Peak uh, while in fire use uh, burned near Manning Metal Reservoir right there, burned in this area right here. Here's the reservoir again. This was last year. It burned last year and then this is, is this year's picture. That picture is taken from inside an exclosure. There's the exclosure, and this is what it looks like outside the exclosure, just in year one. Uh, we have places where we've had conifer harvest and then have uh, done a prescribed fire afterwards on the Tidwell slopes. Uh, there were hundreds of acres of spruce and other conifer that were harvested and then uh, burned afterwards. And, and so we have hundreds of acres of successful aspen regeneration following this. A lot of this area was, uh, was burned using a helitorch. We have some evidence of wildfire in our areas, and the Splatter Canyon is, is located about five miles southeast of Fish Lake. Um, burned in, in 1960, large area, and you can see that, uh, that it has uh, regenerated very well on that slope. have an interesting story to tell at Beaver Mountain um, in, in the place of the Pole Creek Fire. Um, we're showing this picture. Uh, uh, not to get Wayne sampling the, the, the tree and the, the core wasn't uh, sufficient so we just cut the, the tree off and counted the rings directly that way. But in, uh, this is to show what this stand looked like uh, 35 years after the fire. And, uh, and uh, this is the grindstone flat exposure. The, that was in 95. Charles had just taken some, some samples there. And, and then in 96, uh, so this was treated initially in 1934, and then in 96 it burned, and it burned this fence down all the way around the, the exclosure, but it did not go into this, into this treated stand inside here. And, and this again is on Beaver Mountain. This is the Bettinson harvest in, in this early 70s. The Pole Creek fire came through here in 96, but it did not burn in there. The point that we're making with this, we have evidence that where we had a large fire at Pole Creek in 96, it, it did not burn into the areas of Aspen that had been treated in 1934, that had been burned in 1958, or had been harvested in 1970. And so this is showing that over a 20, a 40, a 60 year period where you have had Aspen treated, it can serve as an effective fire break for, for decades to come. Old Roy Fire in 2000 on Monroe Mountain, very close to White Ledge. This is what it looks like in, in, um, in, two, um, in 2005, uh, f uh, five years after the fire. Um, over a thousand acres burned, cattle uh, grazing was excluded from the fire immediately afterwards. There's been sufficient elk and deer in there that we do not have any aspen regeneration to speak of inside that burned area. We used to think that if we could treat an area 20 acres in size, that would be big enough. 
Then we thought of white ledges. If we treated 100 acres, that would be big enough. We, we treated 1,000 acres with wildfire, and that wasn't big enough if we have too many uh, ungulates on the mountain. Again, this area was, was uh, excluded from livestock grazing after the, the fire. Contrast this with Johnson Fire that burned in 2002, and this was last year's picture. You can see the Aspen regeneration coming up. This is on a different mountain. It's near Fish Lake. And you can, part of the success of this is there is a, a low uh, electric fence right below that. But this is uh, Aspen regeneration coming up uh, three years after that wildfire. Again this year, doing very well. And, and some more examples there. So another interesting story that, uh, that we'll share with you, Alan took these pictures of the, I'm telling, I was telling you about the size of harvest units. The Farnsworth harvest was proposed to cut 18 units total of 40 acres. The units were two acres in size and we thought, wow, what's going to happen here? They went in and they cut these small little, little openings in this aspen stand or, or along this area and uh, they had done this uh, a, a year before. Livestock were in this unit all summer long. They had, they had been there all summer and this is what it looked like uh, in on September 11th, 1995. Alan took these pictures and went back five days later to the same unit and that's what it was like. There had been a killing frost on, the, on September 12th. It was the first frost and for whatever reason the animals immediately went to the aspen regeneration. So the lesson that we learned from this is that if we're going to rest an area after it's been treated and, and then eventually bring livestock back into it, we're suggesting that you bring the livestock in in mid-season. Don't, don't graze it early, don't graze it late. The first season of use afterwards should be mid-season. Now, this has a happy ending here. This picture is taken in that same area. And uh, it was kind of a single year event and they, didn't, they took the foliage but not all of the, the suckers. And, and th this is that stand in 2003 this is that same unit now. So with commercial harvest uh, and, and prescribed burning, uh, this is Dyke's Draw. When I went to the forest in 93, we went to visit this area and it didn't look quite like that. And in fact, it had been deemed by the group to be a failure. And it takes a while sometimes for our treatments to mature. So don't rule them out too soon. This is looking pretty good right now. And, and this is one drainage to the south. Again, this is on Monroe Mountain, but it, it's to the south of Langdon. And uh, again, this was harvested and then had a prescribed fire afterwards. I'm just going to sum, I'll summarize real quickly here. Um, we, we do talk about properly functioning conditioning. We say that it exists when soil and water are conserved and plants and animals can grow and reproduce and respond favorably to periodic disturbance. Now that's not the technical definition in the PFC uh, manual, but that's one that we use in our public meetings. Aspen decline occurs when landscapes with, with uh, aspen are outside of properly functioning condition. And, and to determine desired conditions, we, we realize that that's really a social assessment. Um, desired by whom? Or properly functioning for whom? I won't go into great length with this, but it's important that we take the time to make a commitment to have communication, to, to collaborate with each other, to cooperate, to work together to make a difference. It's, this is the social aspect of it. This is how that social interaction took place last year on Mineral Mountain during our, our Aspen Research Summit too. Uh, this particular discussion right there, for those of us that were there viewing this, um, knew that, that this was a very intense discussion going on. This discussion resulted in figuring out a way to find $100,000 to fence some areas. Uh, but it had to come from the appropriate account. It couldn't come from certain accounts, but through this discussion, they were able to find a way to finance $100,000 worth of fencing projects on the Marysville Peak uh, uh, while in fire use. 
use adaptive management, uh, it's important to go back and monitor. And sometimes that monitoring doesn't need to be as detailed as a, as a statistical based scientific study, but take some information that will allow you to monitor what's going on. So our recommendations would be that mixed conifer forests with scattered aspen present have the highest priority for using treatments to restore forest health and sustain functioning aspen ecosystems. Take action now, make the actions large, think about 500 or 1,000 acres per treatment, and uh, take the action often. Aspen roots will generally produce suckers when the stand is treated. Protection is essential in many situations before success occurs and prioritize the stands, treatments and stands where the conifer are replacing aspen and kind of wait for nature to treat the other areas or if you have an opportunity to do a commercial harvest for aspen, do that. Any questions? Oh, yes. Uh, when you talk about uh, doing large treatments like 500 of well for nature, uh, you build fences for that big an area? Um, Part of the reason why we say 500 to 1,000 acres there, that might be the protection that's offered, just the size of the area. Now, I showed you a 1,000 acre burn Oldroyd. Uh, that was an anomaly because that was an area where we have an unusually high number of, of elk. But in almost any other place on the forest, a 500 acre burn will do just fine. Uh, the Johnson, without, without, protection. without protection, the Johnson. The Johnson fire, all we needed was a, an electric fence on the lower edge, and it did fine there. Yes? Now, you showed up, uh, one of your slides was a uh, prescribed fire that looked like it was fairly light, and there was quite a bit of sucker response. Yes. That. What's the, looking at that uh, a little bit further down the road, what's the quality of uh, those uh, sprout seedlings and saplings that result from that? We have every reason to believe that they would be just fine. Like the one slide that I showed earlier of, of doing nothing. It's not unusual in Aspen stands to have a multi-aged uh, structure. And, and I think that they'll do just fine. Yes? You um, also showed a slide where you had wind to the tops. Yes. The tops hoping that that would protect the sprouts. But you didn't tell us whether it did or not. It, it did. Uh, and, and we have some other uh, examples where we've done that too, where leaving a, a, a large amount of residual during the harvest on the ground can make a huge difference in, in allowing suckers to get going those first few years. Yes, Nor? Uh, how long do you expect to leave the fences up before the any fence should be removed? That, um, that's a good question. In, in many cases, they're probably... Um, leaving them up longer than they need to. Typically, we would say that uh, once the, the terminals get to be um, eight, 10 feet tall, that would, that would be sufficient and the fence could probably come down at that point. Um, but, but the Pando clone, that fence has been up for a long time. Um, yeah, but Tom pops up in Arizona. Well, uh, it didn't quite work. Um, Charles, Wayne's the one that needs to, go ahead, Wayne, tell him that. We have a study in Arizona where we uh, did a fence removal study. We found that uh, under intensive elk pressure, the, the suckers or the sprouts have to be an inch and a half of diameter at DBH in order to survive the elk actually riding them over or breaking the tops off and then all of the leaves. So that's a pretty good size, probably 20 foot tall. Um, no. Um, we. There, there are certain areas where we know that wildlife are not the issue, that it's just the livestock, and then in that case, we just use the electric fence. But you're having to use electric fence to No. Any deer out, I know, with electric fence. We, we've tried some of that, but we really haven't been successful with that. We, we, we tried that at White Ledge. Yeah, that's good.